Welcome to Ride IQ. This recording of Office Hours is episode 43 from Tuesday, June 14th. Office Hours are weekly, live, virtual events centered around top of mind, important, and fun equestrian topics. We invite Ride IQ coaches and guest experts to take us on a deep dive of the topic and answer any questions members have. The topic this week was horse fitness with Ride IQ coach and five-star event rider, John Holling. We hope you enjoy this week's Office Hours. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Office Hours. We are here with John Holling, beloved Ride IQ coach and five-star event rider. And today we're talking about horse fitness. And we've talked about horse fitness one other time, but today we really want to cover more bases. A lot of people have reached out and said um, they're looking for help with lower level horse fitness or horse fitness, depending on the specific terrain they have available to them. So we are getting back into this topic and it's one that we could do, you know, several episodes on and <laughs> still not hit everything. So, um, first and foremost, John, thank you yes. so much for taking the time to be here with us tonight. Thanks for having me. I've always loved doing this. It's a good time. Um, I think, the last couple times I did it, I was actually shocked when it was done. I thought, wow, that was really, really fast. So I must be enjoying it. That's, that is a great sign. Um, and I just saw that you have a glass of wine and it made me wish I had a glass of wine, which always helps, <laughs> helps the hour pass and be fun. But I do have a cup of tea, which is also pretty nice for the end of a day. Um, so I, I mentioned that you're a beloved ride IQ coach. I don't want to totally glaze over that because I need to tell you, Kinsey and I are chatting with Ride IQ members every week on the phone. The number right. of people who ex like go out of their way to explicitly tell us how much they love having you as a coach and they love the your lessons. It's like Kinsey and I just chuckle at this point because it is very, you know, we've heard it so many times, but I want to tell you that because it, um, it makes a big difference for people. Well, that's super nice to hear. I appreciate that everybody that I've paid to tell you guys that is doing it. So good job, guys. The checks will keep coming. Um, so that's Perfect. awesome. But no, seriously, it is really nice to hear. So thank you very much. Yeah. Um, and they mentioned, the, they, I think they really like how you, like, you know, sprinkle humor in and they mentioned some of your lines. So anyways, that's going great. And you're one of our I think you might be our very first, if you and Leslie Law were kind of neck and neck for our very first Ride IQ coaches before Ride IQ even had a name or anything behind it. So um, anytime I can be mentioned in the same sentence with Leslie, that's pretty good. So I'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So before we jump into the topic today, you just got back from Ireland. I, Kinsey just told me that you just told me that. Um, yep. So tell us about your trip to Ireland, what you were there for and how it went. Um, yeah, so I needed to restock the the barn with some young prospects. So we went over to Ireland and shopped around. I think we got there. Let's see, we left on the Sunday after Ocala and got in Monday morning at 520. And it was um, me and Jen. She came in as my advisor. And uh, then we brought Caden along. He was the chief videographer and actually had some really good input, input on the horses. Um, so the three of us went over there, made a big trip of it, traveled around the country. We started at Cooley. We went around to a bunch of different places, finished up at Fernhill and then came home on Friday morning. So it was a really fun trip looking at horses, but also got to spend some time with Jen and Caden. We had a couple afternoons where we didn't have as many horses to see. So we kind of got to tour around some of the towns. Um, Jen had one near hospital visit where she thought she had ruptured her appendix. It turned out that actually she just ate dinner too quickly and maybe just had a bit of a stitch in her side. So that was actually really funny. Um, but also I was thankful that she didn't actually need to have her appendix removed and apparently just had gas, which was great. She loves that. I tell people that story. That's an amazing story. Um, <laughs> and I would, I would, I would have expected that, that it wouldn't be Jen who thought her appendix burst. Cause I think Jen is quite tough. Um, she so is. That's why I actually rushed to get the car and took her to the hospital. Cause I think she does not complain about anything. If this was me for sure, for sure. Totally. I would be the one, but now we're, we're pretty tough on each other that way. There's not a lot of sympathy in her, in our house. I remember once I was complaining about um, 
I had a flutter in my heart, which turned out to be AFib, which has been dealt with. So don't anybody worry about it a long time ago, but it was the middle of the night, midnight. I got upstairs. I told her how, you know, my, my heart was racing. I thought maybe I had a problem. She looked at me and said, well, you can go to the hospital. And she made me drive myself. Can you believe that? I can believe that. <laughs> so I should have just told her to take herself to the hospital in Ireland, but I was good. I drove her. Practical. Yeah. Um, I used to have a bit when I was growing up about my appendix bursting. I don't know why I, I don't know why I did it, but probably when I was like 12, I started, if my stomach ever hurt at all, I would go into full tantrum thinking my appendix or saying, I thought my appendix burst probably pretty attention seeking, but right. not like Jen. I know Jen actually was in some pain. <laughs> yeah, no, she was. She was. Um, it was bad. Did you guys find any horses you like that will be coming back to the States or is that on the DL? No, we did. We found, um, Actually, there was a bunch of horses. We probably saw 25 to 30 horses on the trip. Um, and I probably would have come home with about happily like six or eight of them. Um, we vetted two. And the first one definitely has gotten through the pre-purchase. And the second one looks like it has, but I'm just waiting on everybody on my side of the world here to agree. Uh, but it looks like we'll have two nice horses, a five-year-old mare named Esmeralda. Um, who I think we're going to, I think Caden and I decided we're going to call her Zelda. And then there's a very nice French gelding who is four. And that's when we're waiting on the final word. Um, so I won't give his name, but he's a beautiful, beautiful horse as well. So a five-year-old and a four-year-old. And I can't believe the mare is a chestnut mare. Like how I have seriously, I mean, I might regret this, but she's beautiful. So I'm excited. That's so exciting. Congratulations. Thanks. Um, and with that, Kinsey, I'll hand it over to you so we can dive into the topic because I know we do have a lot of questions that people are hoping that we get through. Certainly. So um, I guess we can start. Let's start with a question we got um, ahead of time in the Facebook group. And this is from Kim. She's saying, I have a question about fitness if he gets a chance to answer it. <laughs> My older horse is 21 and will be competing beginner novice this year. He has breathing allergies, so fitness is extra important. What is the best way to get him fit while also putting as little added as possible on his legs? He's sound and happy and actually a four-year-old, but I want to be very careful to preserve that. Um, well, the best thing that I heard there was that she wants to make sure that she does what's needed, but not go crazy with it. Um, and I think that's one thing that I've always sort of felt like I sort of sometimes think when you go to an event and they give the fittest horse award, that I know what they're going for, but I really wish they would call it the most appropriately fit horse award because you want to have your horse 100% fit and ready for the job. But I also feel like you don't want them to have excess, excess pounding on them that you don't need. Um, so for an older beginner novice horse, honestly, I think schedule and consistency is really the most important thing. So my horses at any level, out working in some sort six days a week. That doesn't mean that they have to be getting hammered on six days a week. Um, if I had an older beginner novice horse, you could probably convince me even five days a week would be enough, but I actually think six days is ideal um, because you could take that six day and use it as a hack day, a day to go walking. Um, and don't underestimate how important walking is. Um, and when you're doing that sort of stuff, whether it's walking or your trot sets, I think the other thing that's super important and that Jen actually said to me before I got on, because I was trying to get some pointers here, um, is they have to do it with a purpose. They don't just go out there on a long rain on the buckle and walk and trot around and do their trot sets. They have to be on a contact, working correctly, working their top line. And not just so they're building their top line so they look great, but so that they're building their top line so that they have the correct muscles to keep um, all their parts working so that you're less likely to have injuries. Um, I think the other thing that's important for any horse that's getting fit, but particularly an older horse is that you're working on ideal going, the footing is as good as possible. Um, and also that you've really are taking care of proper shoeing and veterinary work along the way, which I know technically maybe some people would say, well, that's not fitness, but if you're talking about having an event horse going and fit, you got to make sure that their feet are right so that they can take the work. Um, that said, 21 year old event horse, what I would do is I would have, let's say Sundays are day off. Monday would be my day of hacking. Tuesday, I would do flat work. 
And I think at that point, it would be flat work that I wouldn't time. I would be working until I felt like the horse had worked appropriately. So I don't think you need to do 45 minutes worth of work on a beginner novice event horse. Um, you probably can do 20 minutes worth of quality work in a 45 minute ride. Um, Wednesday would be either my trot day or another flat day. Then I'd go on a trot set on Thursday, probably. Um, that would be for my trot sets for like an older beginner novice horse, probably 15 to 20 minutes of trotting, like straight in your 45 minute ride. So it'd be like a 20 minute walk, 15 minute trot, and then a 10 minute walk to cool out, maybe longer. You can never be on walking too long within reason. Um, I'd put a jump day in there. Again, that would be Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday, depending on my schedule. Um, I would never jump after a day off. And I try not to ever jump two days in a row unless I'm at a competition. Um, and then that Saturday, which would be the day before my day off, would be depending on how the week went. Do I want a cross-country school? Do I want a little... Um, extra fitness work with maybe another trot was my flat work not good enough do i need to do a little bit of practice that way um typically for a beginner novice horse i don't feel like you have to gallop them much but sometimes just for their mental sanity to go out for a little canter around and do some little fun canter sets is a good idea so that's probably what i would be doing with that horse okay we got some follow-up questions one yes. how do you t determine the appropriate amount of time for a trot set um, I mean, it's so dependent on where you are in the terrain and what you have. Um, what I can tell you is what my horses do. So if I have a horse that's competing novice, they probably do 20 minutes worth of trot because I feel like 15, it's kind of like, well, what's the point then? Um, at, at that point, I feel like a 15 minute trot, really they're getting more fitness out of doing flat work than they probably would out of the trot. So I sort of start at 20. Um, <clears throat> but again, they walk 20 minutes before that, and they might walk 20 to 30 minutes after that, um, for a training horse, they're probably 20 minutes as well, maybe 25, depending on the type of horse and how heavy they are. If they're a little bit heavier and they need some more work, then they might do 25 a preliminary horse is going to probably do 25 to 30 and your immediate horse is probably going to do 30 ish, uh, depending on what they're getting ready for. And then my advanced horses will do 30 to 35 minutes worth of trotting. Um, again, it's so dependent though. Like right now here in Ocala, it is smoking hot. So I will one, try to do that fitness work earlier in the day. And then I also take into account, like, what is the day like? And do I need to shorten this trot set up a little bit? The other thing I would just add in there with that, with the heat is, sorry, Jess, I know you muted and unmute. I apologize. Uh, but the other thing I would add in there just briefly is, if it's really hot, like it, here is, like it is here in Ocala, sometimes after I do my fitness work, I won't do that final walkout like in the saddle. I'll get them immediately back to the barn, get ice and water on them, get their core temperature down as quickly as possible, and then we'll hand walk them around like you would in an event, right? Like when you get done with cross-country event, you jump off and cool them out. Um, I'm not sure why more of us don't do that at home. Yeah, that's actually a really good point. I think that's one really interesting thing that I've realized more as I get older is how different the show environment is versus the like training environment. And I think um, you see that the professionals like you are are so much more aware of that and are kind of creating that environment at home. And I think that's well, it, the right it, thing it to took do. it took me a little bit to actually figure that out because I remember I was hacking around here like the second or third year I was here and my horse was blowing and I'm like. I've been out here walking for 15 minutes. This thing isn't recovering. And I'm like, yeah, you idiot. Cause it's like 94 degrees. If you were at an event, you'd be off. You've been working longer here than you would at the event and you're walking this poor bugger. So it kind of embarrassingly took me a couple of seasons to figure out like, I don't know, maybe use your head, John. No, I get it. I, I totally can relate. I think that was, yeah. Something I, I never realized either, but um, it makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. Um, so another follow-up question to what you said earlier would be you mentioned that their the horses should be in a frame in their trot sets can we talk a little bit more about that because I think that's something that I was never really told like told or talked about um what do you mean by the frame I mean like it should it be like competition frame can we talk about like what that should look like yeah I mean it depends a little bit on the horse so basically when I go out for if when I get on a horse if it's 
calm, relatively quiet horse that'll walk quietly. I'll let them walk on a longer rein um, just to sort of chill and be comfortable. But I pretty quickly will at least take up the contact in the walk so that they're what I would call through their heads down, their round, their back is coming up. Um, not rounded down and certainly not roll curve, but just connected. Um, and then when I trot, I trot my horses for the most part up in what I would call their competition frame for dressage. So they'd be up and out and through. That said, it is a little bit case dependent on the horse. So you guys all know Kurt and he is a little bit of a wild man and um, he can get a little bit up and upset about stuff. And so I'll work him a little bit deeper rounder because I know he needs to one, relax and two, build that top line and sort of stay relaxed and through. So I'll work him a little bit round and down. That said, 20 minutes doing any one frame isn't going to be all that productive. So like thinking about Kurt or Profit actually is another one who can get a little bit excited. Maybe it's me. Um, I'll work them in that round and down frame. And then after I feel like, okay, this, you know, they're settled in, they're working. This has been a good little work for five, 10 minutes. Then I might pick them up a little bit. Um, Profit travels, which I know I haven't done a ton with him, but you guys will get to know him better. He travels always haunches left. He just always has since the day he was born. We get it looked at and worked on and he gets chiropractic, but he always travels haunches left. So with Profit, once I get him up and through, then I'll work shoulder and left, haunches and right, shoulder and left, haunches and right. And then I might go, well, I, you know, I want to make sure working on stuff. So I'll do a little shoulder in. So I work some stuff. I know some straightening exercises. And I think that's such an important thing with any of your work that you're doing is it's also physiotherapy for your horse. So you have to be thinking about you're their physical therapist out there. If they have a little crookedness, a little unevenness um, in the way they travel, you're supposed to work through that stuff and help them through it. It doesn't make sense to just go out and just go on a long rein, go trot around. It's not going to be a productive work and you're not going to be building the right muscles um, again so that they can carry themselves properly to hopefully prevent injuries and things like that. Yeah, I like that. Um, also, am I talking too fast? Because I feel like I'm flying. No, not. I mean, I can keep up. Okay. <laughs> I think you're doing great. If anybody feels that way, tell the girls and I'll slow down. Yeah, let us know. Um, in the comments, Reagan asked if we would put the schedule that you mentioned on the app. And we will do that. We'll put that in the episode description of this episode. So you can um, look that up there and have it without re-listening. Um, John, at what point do you start incorporating like canter or gallop work with horses is like what level maybe would that start being something that you're keeping track of how much you're doing to contribute to the conditioning? Okay. Um, that's a really good question. So typically with most horses, I start doing some sort of canter sets when they're training level horses. That said, I also wouldn't say that I want to go to an event on a novice horse that's never done a canter set. Um, so I'll play with that a little bit with the younger, greener horses. But to be fair, like if I have a novice horse that's getting ready for an event and I'm going to go out and do a canter set, I'm at my farm here. So I'm probably also doing a cross-country school. Um, so I'm a little bit spoiled in that I've got access. I'm a lot of bit spoiled. Let's be honest. I'm like a brat. But I've got access to a really nice place here with cross-country fences. And so I'll sometimes get a little bit of like double dipping and I'll get my fitness canter in with a cross country school. And that said, even with my upper level horses, when, you know, the season's going really busy and you're thinking I need a cross country school this week, but I also need the gallop and I'm worried about too many miles on my horse's legs. I'll take even with the upper level horses sometimes and do the cross country school. And then when I get done sort of feel them out and say, you know, how much work did they really do? Do I need to go gallop up the back? lane one more time and sort of work those two together. So with the lower level horses, that cantering typically starts at training level, but to be fair, even at the training level horses, they're usually quite green and a little bit need the miles. So I will usually actually make that be with, uh, with a cross country school. Yeah. That is something that like, that makes that, is very reasonable and it also like if you ha keep in mind that even at beginner novice like you're still on course cantering for five to six minutes so practicing that isn't the worst idea because 
you don't want it to be the first time you've ever cantered or, or like cantered in a field for that long to be at the competition. Absolutely. And, you know, the thing is, like, people will say, well, my novice horse doesn't gallop. He's strong. He falls on his head. And you're like, well, maybe you need to go practice it then. So some you know, some of those young horses come out and they gallop great. And you're like, yeah, I got it. This is no problem. You don't need to go do three, five minute canters on a novice horse, but maybe you want to do two, three minute canters. Or if you have access to a hill, go up the hill a few times and just get them starting to learn how to gallop. And I'll tell you what, it's especially important for thoroughbreds that have come off the racetrack because they gallop fast and they gallop low and they run that way, flat and fast. And that's not ideal to be galloping to a jump in so that you have to sort of reteach them how to gallop. Totally. Um, I think that's, that's great advice. So this next question is, um, when you have to give your beginner novice horse a day off, would you rather do a day off midweek or Monday after showing or Friday before Saturday, Sunday show? Great question. So I'll start at the end and work my way back, but I'll forget where I'm going and you'll have to remind me. So I never give my horses the day off before a competition. I just don't, I know some people I know do that. I honestly think that's probably people who are themselves too stressed to deal with the fact that they're going to a competition. And so they're like, I can't deal with one more thing. The horse needs a day off. Well, I don't know. Maybe it's just me, but my horses always go the worst after a day off. Now that said, I don't think you need to like drill on them the day before a competition. You want them to feel great the next day, not sore. So that's a day where I will usually just make sure everything's where it needs to be. Um, if they go great, they might be done working in 20 minutes. If they're a little bit wild, they might be done in 40 minutes. Um, but they, they won't get the day off before the competition. Now, don't everybody get upset that I said that means that you're like too stressed out to deal with competition. That's just me being a jerk. Um, my day off typically would be the day after a competition. Um, that said, I also know there's people who say that that day after the competition, they're going to be a little bit stiff and sore and tight. And so they should go out walking and go for a hack. I would say that's not such a bad idea either. Um, but if you have good turnout, I think you can put them out and they can walk around and sort of recover. So I like them to have the day after a competition or the day after a gallop off if I can. That said, as you go up the levels, like with a lower level horse that's galloping, I'll probably do um, once a week gallops. But as I'm starting to get ready for long competitions, um, mine will gallop every four to five days. So then it gets a little tricky and you kind of just have to fit the day off in where you can, to be honest. Since we we're getting a couple of questions about more about the OTTBs and we'll get to those, but since we're on the day off question for people who aren't able to get to the barn six days a week, let's say they're riding beginner novice or novice. How many days a week is sufficient if they're preparing for a competition? Like if they're riding four days a week and working in that trot set, would you consider that sufficient? I mean, you could do it. I think it's tough on four days a week. It's not impossible. For sure, you can do it. Um, but I do think it's difficult because you have to have one day for a trot set. You have to have one day for a jump. That means you have two days left to basically what you're going to dressage. Well, do you get that hack day where you get to just go out and let them hack around? and chill? Like, I think five to me would be in a perfect world ideal. That said, we don't live in a perfect world. And if four days is what you've got, and you give it your all say, go for it. You know, you're talking about beginner novice, maybe even novice at that point. Um, like that's for real competition, but it's also at a height that's safe enough that I think you could get your horse fit and be safe doing it. I just don't know if you'd be getting the performance that you want out of it. Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, and not to like belabor this point at all, but what are your, what is the right time to be riding your horse twice a day? And do you ever utilize that for really anything? Yeah, it depends on the horse and the fitness level that you need. Um, we do that with the horses sort of, for me, I'd say sort of three-star level and up. Um, that said, it also depends on the horse. So like, again, thinking of the horses that I have, I have profit. He's difficult. Like I love him to death, but he is a tricky little bugger and I can't throw just anybody on him to go for a walk. Um, he's also a pretty naturally fit horse. Um, so he'll go for his walks, but instead of being like going out for an hour in the morning 
and then working in the afternoon, I'll usually send them out for about 40 minutes or so in the morning with Callie, who works here, um, to ride him before I work him. So he'll go out, hack around the farm for a good long walk for 30 to 45 minutes, and then I'll get on him and school him and work him. So it's kind of all in one session. The other reason that I do that with some of the horses is here on the farm, we've got myself with eight stalls and Zach Brandt with 10 stalls renting next to me. And so turnout time can sometimes be a little tricky. And so I have to decide like, okay, do I go for send the horse out for a walk this morning and a work this afternoon and then it misses its turnout? Or do I try to just compress it a little bit with some of them? So sometimes I'll do that. And again, I think the thing is you have to be a little bit flexible and thinking about your particular horse. You know, I can give you guys sort of prescriptions for what most horses should do. So to me, three-star level and up, yeah, those horses should be walking in the mornings, probably four or five days a week, and then working in the afternoon, six days a week or proper works, um, six days a week, but four of those, if that makes sense, four of those riding for a walk in the morning. But I mean, it's not going to be realistic for everybody. And it's not something that has to happen. One thing that I love about office hours and just like the ride IQ lessons in general is even if they're not exactly prescriptive to your situation, you're helping us think through our situation more like a coach would, um, sure. which I know is helpful for me at least. Um, so let's get back to the OTTB questions. One just says, can you talk more about reteaching the gallop? And then Amber, hi, Amber <laughs> said, what are tips to get those uh, thoroughbreds who are naturally quick and low to have a better gallop. I specifically struggle with this where I feel like I'm having to get into my TV before a jump to have a canter to the, <laughs> to jump out of and transitioning to and from that quality cross country canter and gallop on course. Sorry. Mike. No, that makes <laughs> sense. I got it. Not for the first time. Um, so the basic thing that happens with thoroughbreds that have come off the racetrack is they've been taught to grab the bit lower and drop their wither and gallop flat and fast. Right. Um, and obviously that's not how you want to be coming into a fence is with your horses withered low running at the running at the jump. And so I think realistically what you have to do is try to take a little bit of what your dressage canter would be and incorporate that into your gallop. So I don't want everybody to think that this is saying you need to all go out and get giant bridles and bits and all kinds of craziness, but you need to make sure that you have something in your horse's mouth that it's going to respect um, that you can ride softly in. Um, hopefully that's a snaffle, but I also think you have to be realistic about what your horse needs and talk to somebody who sees your horse and knows a little bit about bridles and bits and things, because what you want is that when you put your leg on and you put your horse into the bridle, that it's wither comes up and it's haunches come down, right? We all know that. Well, it doesn't matter if, if your horse is running through your hand, you, you can't make that happen. So I think what I tell my students when we're going out with younger horses on cross country is this maybe goes a little bit to the part about how she was saying that she feels like she has to sit down too much and show jump too much to the cross country fences. I think the last thing that you add on cross country is speed, right? That's the very last piece. So when I go out, and jump a young horse around cross country, I usually force myself to sit down into the saddle 10, 12 strides away from the fence and really keep them between hand and leg. And I'll be honest, I didn't always do that, but I do it now because one, I'm trying to produce these horses to have good records to either be a horse for myself or a student or to be sold. And it doesn't do me any good if they have silly 20s on the record because I just didn't have them really connected and through. But the other thing it does is it gets them in the right balance to have good jumps so that they gain confidence as they go. Um, and so I want to finish a cross country course on a novice horse, maybe even a training horse feeling like, yeah, I probably overprepared by about four or five strides to every fence out there. And then the next time I go out of that horse, I might feel like, okay, I probably overprepared to every fence out there for about, six to eight strides out there so that I can ride it a little softer, a little better every time I go, but I'm going to be almost, this will be very controversial. I almost go out on cross country with the idea that I'm going to like aggressively show jump around that cross country course. 
that's the balance we want. We want them on their hind end. We want them jumping those jumps like they're show jumping. That's the shape that we want. Once we get the horses to understand that that's how they're going to gallop, whether we're doing it at home, right? And I wouldn't say I sit on my horses when I gallop at home. You gallop up in your two point, got to be up in front of you, but they're going to gallop slower. They're not galloping at that point, right? You're talking about a novice horse. You're not galloping so much for fitness as you're galloping to teach them the balance that they want. So I'm not going to be speeding around in the gallop. I'm cantering. And then as I get the balance, I might add a little speed as I feel like the horse sort of has that feel, but they're going to be cantering around. I don't know if that answers the question or not. I think, yeah, no, I think that that definitely answers the question. One point of clarification that I'm just wondering is when you're saying you're like cantering around with them, are you still in gallop position or are you sitting in saddle? I'm in gallop position. So up out of the saddle in two point tall. And there might be times if I'm on one that's just running through me where I might get down the saddle a little bit to push them through. I'm a big advocate of riding in a bridge. Um, on a horse that's getting strong so that I don't have to sit down into them because I find if you have one that's running off and you sit down, they tend to run faster. Um, but if you can settle into your bridge, that's going to help. But no, I think when you're galloping, you should be able to be up in your two point virtually the whole time. Yeah. Um, and if you were to get a horse in your barn, probably not a horse that you would like go out and seek out, like probably not a horse you bought, but maybe a horse comes into your barn for training and it comes in and just like, it's just not a strong galloper. Is that, is that the first thing you do is just go out there and like have it doing a quality canter and then you just, you build up its strength. Is that kind of the, the progress, the progression? Um, it depends a little bit on why or how it's not a strong galloper. Like if it's just gets winded and gets tired quickly from galloping, then yeah, I'd probably go out and gallop that horse, canter that horse, depending on the level. Um, a little bit more. Um, to be honest, I'd also probably question what level the horse wants to event to. Um, if it really didn't gallop well, naturally, then I might think, okay, is this a prospect for me? Or is this somebody's training level horse or somebody's preliminary horse or somebody's beginner novice horse? Or is this a show jumper or a dressage horse? Um, I think if there's one thing that's been proven throughout the years, and I would say is more true than now than ever, is cross country is the heart of our sport. It is the most important piece. And I would much rather be taking a horse that's great on cross country and struggles in the dressage to an event of any level than take one that's great in the dressage and I have to make gallop and go on the cross country because honestly, it's no fun. That's really interesting you mentioned that. That's come up in a, in a number of conversations, whether it's like Sinead's in stride podcast or office hours, but I hadn't heard it a lot before. And it's like, find the job the horse wants to do and that they're good at. And sometimes you can't, you know, you have to work with the horse you have. Um, but it's nice to think of it in that way and not just be like, this is my, this is my event horse and he's going to event whether he likes it or not. Well, right. And it's really hard because like, as an example, I've just bought these two horses. I have, it's, I mean, everybody I'm assuming who's watching this has a horse or access to a horse of some kind. So you guys know when you get a new horse or you have a new one coming, you have all the hopes and dreams. I can see the medals draped around my neck from these horses, right? Like, I'm going to be, it's going to all finally come together, right? It's going to be amazing. Me and Zelda, we're going to just be world beaters. But she might get over here and decide she wants to be a show jumper. And I have to be smart enough and selfless enough, if that's the case, to say, yeah, you know what? You're beautiful and I love you, but you need to go do a different job. You're not going to be the horse I wanted you to be. You can't, you know, shove a square peg into a round hole. And you get these horses and you have these hopes and dreams. And sometimes they stay wonderful horses, but maybe not wonderful horses for the job that you thought they were going to be. And so you have to, you know, I think that's probably the biggest part of our job as trainers and any equestrian sport is making sure that the horses and the riders go into the right places. Totally. I'm glad my microphone was on mute because I snorted when you said you can see the medals around your neck. <laughs> Why are you laughing? Just to, no, I mean, I can see them too, but oh, okay, good. just to admit that to everyone. Um, all right. We have 
first of all, the people who asked about the OTTB says that was very helpful. Um, and then we had another question come in and they said, how do you feel about swimming a horse that is doing modified, especially a horse that's a little bit of a heavier Irish sport horse with no thoroughbred blood. And it's so hot with hard ground in the summer. Um, so I swim horses. I think you have to be a little bit careful to make sure that you don't go too much too fast because it can make their back sore. Um, but absolutely, I swim horses. Um, I had a horse named Downtown Harrison. He was a really good horse for me. And I will tell you that by swimming him, I got three more years out of his career. The last three years of his career, he did not gallop once because if he galloped, he broke. Um, so for him, it was a deal with trying to keep him sound. Um, but I've had other horses and actually funny enough, the one that I swam the most, cause he struggled the most with fitness was a full thoroughbred. Um, and he just was not athletic enough for the job. So we swam him a lot. Um, I don't think there's any problem with swimming a modified horse. I also will aqua tread horses. Um, but any of that stuff that you have access to that said, I'd be very careful that you're doing it with somebody who knows how to swim horses, knows how to, um, do it properly and safely. Um, I did have a horse almost drown on me one time when I was swimming it by myself, like an idiot years ago for a friend. And it was terrifying. And I barely pulled it out as I watched the halter pulling over its head. Um, so don't be like John and be smart and make sure that you have good people. And I've never made that mistake since. Um, but it was really scary. So make sure you have good people that know how to swim horses and know how hard to make them swim. Because typically as an event person, you're going to go there and say, wow, they need to swim more. They need to keep going. And those guys who swim horses, particularly thoroughbred horses, they know how to introduce them to it and do it safely and do it well. Wow. That's a really scary thought or scary <sighs> story. Um, Reagan's asking how often would you swim a horse? Um, well, it depends on the level that it's going. So when my downtown Harrison horse was going, he swam every four days because that's what he needed to be fit. And um, that sort of was the gallop schedule. Um, other horses I've swam where it's sort of an addition to what they do or they aqua tread and it's an addition to what they do. So they might do the aqua tread twice a week and then swim once a week. It really is kind of case dependent. I know that's kind of a non-answer, but it really depends. I'd say at least once a week, probably twice a week. Um, how does the aqua tread differ that much from just straight swimming? So the aqua tread is going to simulate more like your trot sets. It's going to put more top line on your horse. Um, so downtown Harrison, when he went, he aqua treaded twice a week and he swam every four days. Um, he did a lot, but he was also doing four longs at the time. Um, so the aqua tread was to replace all the trotting and the swimming was to replace the galloping. So with the swimming, you're going to get the big lung capacity, the big blow that you want. Where so that's going to be more your anaerobic workout um, that you want to get to. And then the aqua tread is going to be more of your aerobic workout and building that top line and that base fitness. Yeah. One thing I've like thought about a lot recently is like how after like a, a hard workout, I can like barely walk the next day. And I just think about horses and I'm like, I never really gave my horse like the chance to like feel bad after a hard day's work. Um, whereas like I, I always feel bad after, after a hard workout. So it's like, it's interesting. And I think it's way more a thing today to have your horse have like chiropractor and massage and like, like all that wonderful care. And I, um, it just, I think that's, that's great because I'm sure they're feeling it the next day. Yeah, absolutely. We have great physio and chiropractors that work on our horses. And the other thing is, Kinsey, like they, if I have my horses and I didn't used to do this and I do now, if my horses go and they put in a good weekend and they work hard and they do two jumping rounds and they jump great, or maybe they don't jump great, but they work really hard. I'll come home and they might that week get two days off because I think, you know what, it's been a long season. You worked really hard and you're going to get two days off. And you know what? they come out better on Wednesday than they would have on Tuesday and they're happy. Yeah. I love that. Um, so Amanda is asking in chat, she's saying, I'm curious about how John approaches the difference between young thoroughbred versus young warm blood when getting them fit, such as after several weeks of long walk work, if that makes sense. 
Um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting because I will say I think the warm blood breeders are doing such a good job putting blood into those purpose-bred sport horses for eventing that they're very thoroughbred. Like Sir Kurt, for an example, he's he's very thoroughbred to ride, but he is, he's warm blood. Um, you know, he's Zangershied. And so, I mean, with the young horses, with the thoroughbreds, I actually find it's about teaching them how to gallop up. And with the warm bloods, it's about teaching them how to sort of take you and gallop forward without getting strong and pulling you over their head. Um, but I don't, you know, I guess the generic answer is the thoroughbreds are going to probably work more on the strength stuff, the sitting down and working on building muscle and doing like what I'd call squats. And the warm bloods are going to work a little bit more on taking me and being brave and going forward. But that's kind of a cheesy generic answer because it's, again, so dependent on what you're sitting on. Profits, Tricaner, that is the hottest, fastest, speediest horse I've ever sat on in my entire life. He's like, he's like, I don't know what the fastest little car I can think of is, but he is like a little sportster and he's warm blood. And the last thing he needs to do is learn how to go faster. Trust me. It's like riding a ninja. <laughs> that's amazing. I, I had a trainer at one point who liked to take off with me and I was like 12 at the time. So I was really, he's 17 one too. So really long for the ride. Um, we have a question in chat that relates to what we were talking about earlier in terms of like fitness for a beginner novice level horse, but it's referring to if you're taking them right out of the pasture. So she said, hi, Radic, you friends and John, what are some generalized guidelines for bringing a 10 year old quarter horse who has been enjoying his pasture puff life for one to two years in the shape for potential beginner novice in the fall? She's riding super early in the mornings before work with the heat. She can do shorter rides or hacking or trot sets. Um, with a bit of canter four times a week, but she's asking for a general rule of thumb for bringing this horse back. And if there are any, like, do not do this tips for that sort of thing, she would love help with that. Okay. Um, so I think to get it ready for a beginner novice in the fall is pretty realistic. That said, being out in a field doing nothing for a year or two, it's a big ask, right? To get ready by this autumn, we're already, what, June, um, to be ready to to event. Um, so I think the one thing is you need to spend some time walking. So get your AirPods out and listen to the ride IQ shows, um, entertain yourself with the John and Rick show and all of the other great podcasts that you can find because you're going to be walking for probably a couple weeks, quite honestly. Um, but walking with a purpose round connected, you can do some leg yield stuff, some shoulder in stuff. I think if you do that for probably two weeks, then it's realistic to think, okay, now you can go and start adding in a little bit of trot work and do some, you know, trot sets. Um, probably at that point in week three, and this is very generic, and I could probably, um, you know, somebody else will come on and say that I'm doing it the wrong way, but thinking of what your goal is and trying to sort of a little bit fast track some stuff, um, you probably could start at like five or 10 minute trots, depending on how the heat is. Um, how tired your horse feels, probably do a week of 10 minute trots. And then you could bump it up a little bit to your like around 15 minute trots at that point for a beginner novice horse after what now we're talking a month, um, you start doing some real flat work for a week or two. And then I'd probably start jumping. So you're probably out of the field looking at a month to six weeks of hacking, trotting and flat work before you start jumping. That would be my advice. And that to be honest, it may sound long, but I think that's incredibly quick to be fair. Yeah. I think that sounds reasonable. This, that was Christina, by the way. And she said, your adorable God donkey says hi. And I'm assuming you know what that means. Oh, I do know. Hi, Christina. He is a cute little donkey. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's, that's amazing. <laughs> um, this has been so helpful. So one, one thing that I think I, I always wanted to know more about or like didn't really understand is um, how do you determine the, and we kind of got into this with the process, but how do you determine the length of time to be cantering? And it, like, if you're, if you're going training or modified or whatever level above that, um, should you, like, it kind of seems like everyone's like three sets of five and then three sets of six. Like, is that kind of just where you should start or how do you determine that as a coach? 
Um, okay, so again, I give the disclaimer, it's all dependent on what you're sitting on. And the other thing that it's dependent on is what the terrain is that you have available. So here on my farm, we actually don't have much of a hill. So most of my horses, when they start the gallop sets at training level, I'll do sets. So they'll go out, they'll do a 15 minute trot. I used to do 20s, but it's so hot down here that I shortened that up to 15. In the wintertime, it might be 20. Um, and so at training level, usually I'll do a four minute canter with a three to four minute break in walk. Then I do a three minute canter with a three to four minute break in walk. And then I'll do a four minute canter. Um, and then I walk them out. If they're going preliminary, they start at four minute canters. Um, and then I try to actually get sort of once they're ready to do a too long or getting ready to do a too long and up, I'm really fortunate that down the road here, I have access to a property with a hill. And so I'll go use my hill and my hill isn't, you know, like this giant massive slope, but it's a pretty good slope that takes me about three and a half minutes to get from the bottom up to the top. And I don't fly. I go and people are going to say, how many meters a minute do you, I have no idea guys. I go sort of preliminary ish speed. Um, to start. And I'll usually go trot around. I have a track that I do up and down the hills that takes me about 15 minutes to get back to the start. And then I will start going up that hill twice for the three and a half to four minutes. Um, if they're doing three star for this particular hill, then I'll usually go up three times and four star. I go up about four times. It's you know very scientific. I went with the star system. So I assume five stars, I'd probably go up five. Um, I do that four to five days a week, so four to five days a week, four to five day intervals between them. Okay. Um, don't do it four to five days a week, guys. I can already hear it. John said, um, yeah. So every four to five days they go over and go up that hill. Um, and obviously the advantage to that is if I were here on my farm, getting a horse ready for, let's just say a three star, I would probably have to be doing three, seven minute canters for that. Um, to get to Kentucky, you'd probably be talking eight. I would try it like heck, even on the flat, not to do nine minute canters. I think that's pretty brutal. Um, but you're probably doing three, eight minute canters every four days to get ready for Kentucky. That's a lot of pounding on your horses. So the advantage is by using my hill, it takes me by the time I'm getting one fit to go advance, probably three minutes to get up that hill. I'd go up at what'd we say four times for a four star. So as opposed to doing 21 minutes quick guys, what's four times four is four, eight, 12, 16, right? So less galloping, less pounding on their legs. Thank God that worked out. I thought maybe I'd done the math wrong and I was doing more minutes of canter, but I'm not. No, beautifully done. That <laughs> worked out really well. Um, <laughs> so when people were reaching out about like, for example, conditioning at the lower levels, it was partially to make sure that they're doing the right thing and partially to start teaching themselves how to get into the routine and just learn about it before, you know, they're going training or prelim and it's really like very important yeah. to know what they're doing. Um, can we talk about after a day of conditioning, whatever that is, the things you're doing to help your horse recover and, and talk about it in the mindset of someone learning how, how, like what process they should be going through, what steps they should be taking if their horse has just had trot set or even a canter set for their conditioning day. Yeah, absolutely. So I think if I'm taking a novice or a training horse out to do their trot set, um, one thing I do on the next day is I try to learn and I learn what did that trot set do to them? How do they feel? Are they better? Some of them come out the next day and they're much better because they feel a little bit like, oh, I was out of the ring. I feel fresh and I'm happy and they take me around. Some of them get quite wooden. And then I think one, and probably the first thing I think is, how could I have done my trot set better yesterday? Um, could I have incorporated more shoulder in, more leg yield, more haunches in, more of that kind of stuff? And don't wait until you have a dressage test that makes you do that stuff. That stuff is all training exercises. So my novice horses will do a little shoulder in, leg yield, haunches in, um, even some counter canter if they can. Um, but thinking of a trot set, they'll do that stuff so that their body stays soft and supple. Again, going back to that physio thing. And so after I think about how I could have done my trot set better, then I think, okay, so if this horse is a little stiff from going out trotting, do I need to work it round and down? 
is it tight in the shoulder? Is it tight in the hymen? And, you know, one thing that actually I do um, when I'm in my ring is I'll ride around and I'll just close my eyes and really feel what's happening underneath me. Maybe don't close your eyes the whole time. I don't want you guys running into stuff, but I'll close my eyes and try to feel what the horse is doing underneath me rather than kind of looking and trying to see it. Um, that just helps me kind of feel them. And, and then again, approach that ride, even though maybe you're doing your dressage the next day, approach that ride as, as your, as your physical therapy for that horse to make sure that it's working correctly and soft. Um, so that's what I do after a trot set. After a gallop, again, probably when we're talking about a novice or training horse, the day after my gallop would be a day off. Um, so then I'd have a gallop day off, and then I'd be back riding. I think the big thing at that point is to be patient with them. They, as a young horse or even an older horse that's competing at novice or beginner novice level or even training level, um, after a gallop and then a day off out in the field, they're going to come out and feel kind of like we all do on Monday morning going back to work. Like, oh, here we go again, right? So if, and I actually just taught somebody this uh, in a lesson today, you know, if you get on them and the first thing you do is grab the reins and pull their head down and make them go round, that's not a really enjoyable thing to do. That's like going into the office and your boss is standing there with a stack of papers and says, here, Jessa, welcome back to work. Get to it. You don't have time for a coffee. I don't care, right? It's you got to go out there, let them hack around, let them relax. Maybe that first day back, they do 20 minutes of walking and then they just do a little bendy, stretchy stuff. You know, there's definitely lessons I've done here in the ride IQ thing where it's about the day after a day off and it's a lot of stretchy stuff, a lot of fun stuff and trying to make it be an enjoyable thing for the horses so that they want to be there. You've mentioned the heat in Florida and how you have to take that in, in, into account when you're getting your horses into shape. Do you let your horses down at all during the summer? Like you don't necessarily keep them in like their best shape, like competition shape, or do you try to maintain it throughout the, throughout the summer into the fall season? Yeah. So actually my horses all except for one are on vacation right now. Um, they ran at Ocala. That was the last run of the year. Um, none of them had longs this spring. Um, so they're getting two to three weeks out. And in that, I also keep an eye on them. So like I had one who was running a little bit, Polo was running around the field a little bit. And so I almost put him back to work just to like go walking under tack. And then he took a breath and he's been much better. So he goes out and they're all just on vacation right now. I'm a big advocate of that. I think as they get older, maybe they don't need to have quite as much time off and they should at least keep walking under saddle. I think that's um, a, a good thing to do for them so that it's, they just sort of keep their top line and keep everything going. But I think especially in this country, the season runs now 12 months a year. And it's so easy, especially with the young horses, because they don't have the longs to just keep going. And it's not about the number of runs that you do in the season, right? Like you may say to me, well, yeah, I worked him all year, but he only did six events. Okay, but you had him up working for 12 months. So they do need time. So I forced myself to give them a short holiday this time of year. And then after they do their season in the autumn, somewhere around October or November, they get another break. And I'll be honest, my horses don't compete much in January down here, which is a huge season in Ocala, but I think it's a bit too early for most of them to be out eventing. They don't get a holiday. So if we event till November at um, Tryon or what will soon be Terra Nova next year, um, then they need a break and they probably don't come out starting in January. And believe me, guys, even for me, that's tough to do because you have peer pressure of all of your pals and all of your fellow professionals out there eventing in January. And you're like, I'm, I'm falling behind. I'm not doing it. But trust me, your horse's bodies need time to recover and recoup. Total bodies and minds, <laughs> just yeah. like humans. Me too. Yeah. Um, so Reagan asks if you don't have a hill, do you ever use something like an equiband or do you have exercises to help with that? Anything that you're doing if you don't have a hill at your disposal? Um, so no, I don't have a lot of gadgets that I use. Um, and not because I'm anti gadget, but because I just don't know many of them to use. Um, so I just try to ride them on the flat 
where they're going to be a little bit more through. But to be honest, I do that without a hill. Um, so without the hill, I think the big thing is, or I do that with a hill is what I meant to say. You got it. Um, I think the big thing that the hill does is it just shortens up the amount of time that you have to be out galloping and trotting. Um, so if you don't have the hill, you're going to have to do sets that are going to be a little bit longer. Um, so depending on the level you're going, you just have to figure you're going to do those three by four, three by five, three by six minute canters, um, which is fine. Just make sure you have good footing that you're keeping on top of your horse's feet and their soundness and all the stuff that you would do if you did have the hill, you're just going to have to put a little bit more time in the saddle, um, making sure they get, get that big lung capacity and that big blow. Yeah, absolutely. So before you go and take a horse, like upgrade to a new level um, or take them to their first event, how do you determine if they are in the proper shape to be doing that level? Is it like how quickly their heart rate comes down after doing a conditioning set or how, what, what kind of makes an indicator for you that you feel good about them going out on cross country? Yeah. Okay. So that's actually really, really kind of a fun one for me because one thing we have now is we have all these heart rate monitors and I think they're really cool. And so what you want to do is figure out what their um, anaerobic anaerobic threshold is. And I'm a terrible number guy, so I have to look it up all the time, but there is a number there that you want to have the horse's heart rate get under. Um, for me, that's super, super helpful. So what I'll do is I'll do my canter set. I'll check the heart rate monitor and go, right. Okay. So how quickly did the horse get down below that? anaerobic threshold and you kind of want when you're when you kind of you want when you're galloping them to get them up right to and just into the anaerobic area and then bring them back and then get them up to it again and then bring them back and that's what the sets are about you build them up to that anaerobic threshold get them just over it peak them and then get them to come back down and that's what that three to four minute break is if i'm cantering a horse and i can't get them to go down below that anaerobic threshold in four minutes then i stop and I take them back. And the next time I change what I'm doing, maybe I canter a little bit less or a little bit slower, um, but they have to be able to recover. And that's a trick down here in Florida because it's hot. Um, now, you may not have access to a heart rate monitor and sometimes I don't either. And sometimes I just don't feel like hooking it up. So what I was taught a long time ago is to take respirations. So what I'll do is when I stop galloping, hopefully you have a horse that'll stand still or if you're on profit and he won't, you just have to sort of do the best you can and watch their nostrils flare or watch their sides. If they'll stand still, watch their breath. And you start to watch or you check your watch and you count how many respirations your horse takes in 15 seconds. And then you multiply that by four and you want to basically very generically. And I know um, there's a lot of scientists who would say that it's not that accurate, but this is just what I was taught and it's worked well for me. You want that respiration to get up to 80 is where that anaerobic aerobic threshold would be. So then again, that's 80 breaths in a minute. So it's whatever that number is. So you can get up to 20. Um, you want it to get up to 80 or just above. So usually for me, when I count to 15, I want to be somewhere between 18 and maybe 24 to feel like, okay, I've gotten about right. And then I want them to get down below 20 before I start my next gallop set. And I'll do that. So I do the first one, watch them recover, get down to hopefully like 16, 17 breaths in a minute. Um, then do my next set and then they'll probably get a little higher they might get down to like 18 and then I'll do my next one. And then they might be a little bit longer to recover. Maybe we don't get there in four, but okay, we're, we're good. And then I keep track of that for the next time that all of that said, I've been doing this since I was 19 and I also do a lot of it just off a of feel and how they're feeling underneath me. But that's sort of the prescription for it is if you don't have access to a heart rate monitor and the technology, then it's about how quick can they get down below 80 breaths a minute. And if they don't do it in four minutes, I think you guys stop and go do it again the next time. Well, that couldn't have been a more perfect answer because I was concerned we weren't going to get to a question about what you think about heart rate monitors. So yeah, you killed you two birds with one stone right at the end there. Um, and we are at the end of the hour here. And um, thank you, John, of course, like that was amazing and so much information. And thank you everyone who attended because that was really great questions coming in, um, the whole time really. So 
that was fun. And yeah, thanks for having me, guys. I had a great time. Here. I love being able to talk and see myself on a screen. It's perfect. It goes so fast. <laughs> Well, we always love the opportunity to chat with you too. Um, the hour flies by for us as well. So um, thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your evening. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for being Rad IQ members. And have a good rest of the week. Thanks, guys. Have a good Bye, night. everyone. Before you go, I just want to let you know more about Ride IQ. At its core, Ride IQ gives everyone access to instruction from the best equestrian coaches in the world. It might sound impossible, but with Ride IQ, you get access to the private mobile app that has hundreds of on-demand, listen while you ride audio lessons taught by top riders and coaches in eventing, hunter jumpers, and dressage. Here's how it works. You look through the app and choose a lesson based on your horse or a skill you're working on. There are lessons for green off the track thoroughbreds and nervous horses and horses that are behind the leg, as well as lessons that teach every stage of skills like shoulder in or trot lengthenings. Then you tack up and press play and you have a top coach like Doug Payne or Leslie Law or Gina Smith in your ear guiding you every step of the way. 